Okay, yes, it's up now. We can see it. Thank okay, you. Okay, I'm really sorry for that. No worries. So let me start again. I mean, I'm not going to, you already heard what I had to say uh, for now, but um, I'll go back to the slide where I was specifically. So I was just mentioning about the, the launch of the buildings breakthrough, where we have now 29 countries collaborate, uh, collaborating with a number of initiatives to specifically look at um, standards, uh, what what does it mean to go towards near zero and uh, resilient buildings, uh, and what would be the requirements and standards for it, looking at specifically at demand creation and procurement, how can we accelerate co procurement in that domain, looking specifically at finance also, uh, at capacity building, and then also uh, at research and development. So this is an a platform basically for collaboration between countries. And then we organized the Buildings and Climate Global Forum uh, in Paris uh, in March. And at the forum, we actually uh, have um, a declaration that was endorsed by about 70 countries uh, that actually also uh, looks specifically at the collaboration between countries and gives us the mandate to set up an intergovernmental a council for buildings and climate, which we are in the process to set up. So this is, I would say, an effort of eight years because, I mean, it's a bit of a culmination of our results. Um, however, the, the, the sector is still a very critical sector, as you know. Uh, why do we focus on buildings? Uh, as you know, the IPCC uh, tells that it's about 21% of the global emissions. It's also a major consumer of natural resources, over one third of material consumption. And that's coming from OECD study. Of course, highly vulnerable to climate change. I mean, if we think about all the issues of temperatures rising and cooling becomes a very important issue for a number of countries, but uh, not only also the performance and overall durability and safety, because of course our infrastructure are uh, very vulnerable to high uh, like uh, extreme weather events in general. Um, however, there's still a need for more buildings. And I mean, we might say maybe not that much in the global North countries, but in the global South, it's still projected that about half of the buildings that will exist in 2050 have not yet been built. So a lot of construction still going on. And, and you know that in these countries, there's a very important also backlog in terms of housing. And then uh, I would say in our countries, we are more with an aging uh, existing building stock that needs to be renovated. Um, and that's another challenge. And then it's a key sector for our national economies and for employment in general. It's about 11 to 30% of GDP and about 7% of global employment. So it's a very important sector for uh, all the economies. So we've been tracking since 2015, and you can see here the different covers of our global status report on buildings and construction. And what we unfortunately see is that uh, there's a stagnation in progress since 2015, uh, and we definitely need to reduce uh, emissions if we want to be on track for uh, the Paris Agreement. So, I mean, on the on the um, image you can see here, I mean, it's basically showing what would be the ideal track where we need to be. So the blue line is where we should be in terms of uh, decarbonization. That's the progress that we need to have if we want to get to zero carbon by 2050. Uh, and as you can see, the gap is just increasing over time. Looking at the emissions, uh, so these are the energy related emissions and energy demand by the sector. I mean, it is more than 30% of the, like more than a third, I would say, of uh, the, the emissions. Uh, most of the emissions currently are still what we call the operational emissions of the building. So once the building is constructed and used, it's basically the energy use in the building. Uh, but uh, we have a growing, um, emissions in terms of uh, what we call embodied carbon and which is the materials, uh, mainly the materials that go into the process, but also all the process of constructing the building is part of the embodied carbon. So some progress over the years, but not enough. Um, energy intensity has increased only 5% since 2015. Uh, in 
in terms of emissions, we've seen an increase of 1% per year since 2015 in the sector. Uh, the energy efficiency investments have been increasing quite a bit, but they're still way too low. They only represent 5% of global investment in the building sector. We know that we also need to increase the renewable share. This is a more general need for the energy sector, but that's what also uh, leads to the final energy demand in buildings. And it's currently about half of what we would need. Um, and then in terms of building energy codes, more and more countries have been developed building energy codes, um, but most of these energy codes are outdated or still not ambitious enough. And there are only three countries in the world currently that have energy codes that are aligned with zero energy buildings. And then uh, you know about the nationally determined contributions, so the commitments that countries have for, uh, in terms of Paris Agreement, their climate commitments. So there's been doubling of the number of countries that mentioned buildings in their NDCs in 2015, but uh, there's still a lot of the actions are not super clear and ambitious enough, um, and the targets are also not ambitious enough. So still quite uh, some, some work to do in the sector. Now, when we talk about decarbonizing, we need to really think about decarbonizing along the life cycle. Uh, and so that's why we need to address both the embodied carbon and the operational carbon. And we're pushing for what we call a whole building life cycle and systems approach to decarbonization. And in this context, the main challenge is actually related to the materials. Uh, materials are the biggest part, as I mentioned, of the embodied carbon. And today there's like not enough action that is being taken to decarbonize materials. And we know that there's going to be uh, growth in terms of use of materials for construction. And overall, they already dominate the, 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 the resource consumption, as you can see in the graph that is represented here. Uh, and it is expected that by 2050, uh, about half of the emissions of a building will actually be embodied carbon emissions. Um, so while we've been working a lot on energy efficiency, and actually most of the countries, when they talk about buildings in their NDC, they talk about energy efficiency. Um, there's not been enough action or uh, priorities put forward specifically to address these embodied carbon emissions. So what do we propose here is that um, there needs to be a stronger strategy in terms of like uh, taking action towards materials. Uh, and, and the first action is really what we would call avoid. I mean, how do we build with less materials and how do we avoid waste? So bringing more resource efficient construction. Currently, we have in some cases calls for safety reasons that are actually um, oversizing the need that the, 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 the need for cement, for example, or concrete in the foundations. We could reduce the amount, uh, but we also bring more circularity approaches and ensure more recyclability and reuse of materials. Um, so these are some of the this would be like the first most important strategy to concentrate on and probably currently still the most challenging one. Then there needs to be a shift to, I would say, more alternative bio-based materials um, to actually reduce the share of, uh, of conventional building materials, which are actually the ones that create most of the emissions. Um, so there is there are quite a number of good materials put forward, but the difficulty is to actually bring them on the market uh, and to standardize and certify them. So there's a lot of innovation happening in the in the sector, but but changing the market is a, is a challenge. And then of course we still need to improve the conventional materials uh, mm -hmm. that will continue being used, like cement and steel. Uh, cement is the one that actually is the is the most consumed, the second most consumed product after potable water in the world. So it's a very important share of the materials that we use um, and we could definitely diversify. So what's the challenge here for the policymakers is that we need over time to actually reduce the amount of non-reviewable materials. Um, and this includes by actually doing quite a bit of bringing more circularity in the sector. And then over time, of course, bringing those bio-based materials forward. So 
this is this is I think where where we need to to act over the coming years, especially when we look at all the countries where a lot of the construction will be happening, which currently are countries that actually don't have that many emissions. And most of their emissions will not really come from the operation of a building, but will actually come from uh, the, the construction of the, of the buildings. Now, looking at some of the actions that are taken, there are a number of countries that have been putting forward sustainable public procurement as one of the tools. And, and especially we, we point at the fact that governments can lead by example. Um, and in many countries, you have certification systems that have been put forward that ensure that the contractors are being selected are following a certain number of standards, um, as you can see some of the examples here. Some of the challenges, of course, that I see in this is that even if you have policies in place and even if you have some of these tools in place, unfortunately, I would say the enforcement uh, and implementation of those often remains a challenge. And it's also a sector where there's quite a bit of corruption when you go into the Global South countries. And so it's still a very complex sector to, to, to work on. So what do we have in terms of recommendations? I mean, we are pushing all countries to put climate action roadmaps forward for the sector that take a life cycle approach. Uh, we are pushing, of course, for strengthening building energy codes, and we would even say mandatory building codes because mandatory codes are actually the ones that really make the difference. It's good to have voluntary ones, but the voluntary ones don't help accelerate uh, the the. the I mean, the impacts are not as fast as with mandatory building codes. There needs to be more investment in building decarbonization, or I would say even green buildings overall, um, and policies, of course, to reduce embodied carbon, but also promote retrofitting and then uh, leading by example. And in our declaration that we are where we had about 70 countries uh, joining uh, in Paris in March, uh, we actually have more or less the same points put forward, which were the points that actually the countries have committed that these are the actions that we, they would take to um, actually support the transformation of the sector. Overall, I think the important thing is that transforming the buildings and construction sector is not something that is only in the hands of government. There are a lot of different actors involved and it's a, complex, a pretty complex sector. Uh, with a very fragmented value chain. And so it's really important to, to push for collaboration uh, and radical collaboration between, between all the, the different stakeholders of the sector. So this was my introduction today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for the very interesting presentation. Um, let us now move on to the